Okay, there we are. Can you see us okay? Yeah. I look frozen to me. Am I frozen yeah, to you? I don't look like I'm frozen. We're going to unfreeze you. you gonna, all right. I think that's because the phone you just turned off was spotlighted. All right. The spotlighting needs to change to the computer. All right. Let me, let me try it one more time. All righty. Hang on. Okay, and we go like this. And how about that? Outstanding. All right, we're set. There you go. I see that Worcester shirt. I, I see that Worcester shirt. <laughs> I'm actually a. Um, I'm a I mean, off the charts. Is this this camera plugged in? Yeah. All righty. Well, this is Liz, my girlfriend. <laughs> Because All righty. Well, um, let me in invite you all to give thought to questions you might have. Can you hear me and see me okay? Okay. Um, but I think that I could probably uh, summarize um, everything I've learned about the business of baseball mm -hmm. in three stories. And I'll tell you those stories. Um, and then, uh, and then I'll answer your questions. How about that? So I was, you know, blessed to be born and raised in Baltimore, went to Bethel and, um, um, uh, got to have an internship with the Orioles and it, um, it, that started in high school and wound up going right through college and right through dental school. And when I graduated dental school, thinking I was going to be a normal, nice Jewish dentist, um, as, as my father was, really like was um, the, a funny thing happened on, on the way to the dentist. The Orioles let me continue. So I wound up being there 19 years. And then we moved out to San Diego, took over the San Diego Padres. And then we moved to Boston in 2002. It was kind of uh, like the elevation of going to the highest level you could because the challenge in Boston was unlike any other. They hadn't won a World Series in 86 years, actually 83 when we arrived. And um, it was unlike any other atmosphere. You know, Baltimore was a nice, sweet city. San Diego was very tranquil. And Boston was tough. Boston, they, they didn't even want promotional giveaways. They, they thought it was a bribe to try to distract you from the fact that we hadn't won a World Series. We don't need your t-shirts. Just win a World Series. All right, fine. So. What happened was at the end of our second year, it was 2003, and our dreams of, of a World Series had been punctured by an Aaron Boone game-winning home run as the Yankees, the dreaded Yankees, beat the Red Sox in the American League Championship Series. The only thing that could be worse than a November in Boston after losing like that was being in November in Boston in a budget meeting. And there I am seated across from three accountants from our finance department. And their job, their role was to poke holes in my claims of what we needed to spend the next year. While my boss and mentor, Larry Lucchino, would sit at the head of the table like a magistrate in judgment. And the stronger your case, well, the more you had a chance of getting the money you wanted, but you were up against three people with verbal machine guns. And one of them in the middle said, uh, Charles, do we really need to spend $20,000 next year on our winter caravans? Now, our winter caravans were trips with, four, with uh, current ball players to each of the six New England states in the dead of winter when baseball interest is at its nadir and you just want to foster player fan interaction. And he continued, he said, after all, we're probably gonna sell out every game even if we don't go because we had started selling out games May 15th of that year. I said, no, 
we don't need to spend that $20,000. You can check it off on your list. You can pat yourself on the back. You can go home and have dinner with your wife and say, I saved $20,000. But don't think that the fans won't notice. Don't think that they won't recognize that you're trying to pull back on what you've done before. Don't think that they won't notice the sour seeds of arrogance are being planted in the soil. And then I got a little more animated. And so Larry Lucchino said, okay, okay, you made your point. We'll still do the So on a cold January day, it was a Wednesday, somewhere around January 24th, we have a bus in front of Fenway Park. And onto this bus, we have Jason Veritek, a good ball player, wound up uh, being the captain of our team. Uh, Bill Miller, a good switch hitting third baseman. Kevin Millar, a funny uh, first baseman, good guy. And we have all of our staff who help us on these events. And we go down to a mall in Rhode Island on a Wednesday at lunchtime. And we got to be in Connecticut by nightfall. And the line throughout the mall is amazingly long. There are all of these people here to meet these three ball players. Interest is so high. And we set up the pipe and the draping and the table and the chairs and the ball players are sitting there and they're signing autographs. And I start to worry because the line's too long. We're not gonna get to everybody. After all, we've got to be in Connecticut later on. What are you going to do? Well, we improvise. My father had told me that there was a Yiddish expression whose translation was everything for the children. So we pull the children out of line and we focus on them. I can deal with a frustrated adult, but I can't have a crying child. And so the kids are getting the autographs, but even that line is long. This is a school day. Why aren't these kids in school? It's amazing. And I'm worried again. So we have to improvise again. I tell you what, let's take Bill Miller and put him at the back of the line and have him start right signing autographs from back to front. And the will reach an intersection where everybody has met somebody. Everybody will get an autograph. And that's what we did. And so it was that every child got an autograph and the security people took down the pipe and the draping and the table and the chairs and the ball players were whisked out of the mall to a bus. Why is that kid crying? And over there, there's this 11 year old with pudgy cheeks and Norman Rockwell tears coming down his face wearing a Veritech jersey. And um, you can't quite tell on this, but a body not dissimilar from mine, both in childhood and now. And I went over to him and I put my arm around him. I said, what's the matter? He said, I got out of school today to meet Jason Veritech. I said, and you only met Bill Miller? He goes, mm-hmm. He said, I'm a catcher like he is. I thought, I knew that. Same body type. They always made us the catchers. I said, you know what? That bus isn't leaving without me. Just stay with me. And I put my arm around him and walked nonchalantly through the mall onto the bus. His mother's chasing me. What are you doing with my kid? We get on the bus. He meets Jason Veritek, who signs the jersey. The mother's taken pictures. He reacquaints himself with Bill Miller. He meets Kevin Millar. Off he goes, off they go, and we do the good deed. You're never going to see him again. You don't know who he was, but you just did the good deed for the child. So now, later that year, it's the 2004 season, and one of my favorite things would be to go on a train by myself from Boston to New York when the Red Sox were playing the Yankees at Yankee Stadium. They were big events, and I had no responsibilities. I could just be the 10-year-old fan that I still am. So I'm on the train, 
on a on a about 11 a.m. Acela uh, on a train to New York, and here comes the conductor, a rather surly older fellow. Tickets, please. Tickets, please. So I give him my ticket, and I pulled down the tray of the seat in front of me to do my work, and I had some of my books out. And he looks at me and says, what are those? I said, well, that's my work. What do you mean? I said, well, I work with the Boston Red Sox. Well, now this is a train that connects Boston and New York. This could go either way. <laughs> and he looks at me with a snarl in his eyes and goes, I've been waiting all my life for them to win the World Series. I won't live to see the day. And with that, he walks off. And you realize that actually went well. That meant that he was a Red Sox fan. Now, we promised our fans who live in New York, we actually have Red Sox fans in New York, that if we ever won, we would bring the World Series trophy to them to celebrate. Well, lo and behold, we win the World Series, and the same group that does the caravans gets on a, an Acela on a cold November night. It was around November 12th or so. And at the end of the aisle of the, car, of the train car, there was extra space for bulky luggage. Well, the World Series trophy is encased in a black and silver trunk, an anvil case. And it fit completely in the space, used up all the space. And we put it there. Down the aisle comes the conductor, the same conductor. He looks at the case and says to the security guys, you can't put that. And then he looks at me and then looks at the case and looks at me and says, is that what I think it is? I said, it is. He said, can I see it? I said, you can. And we open up the case and we take out the World Series trophy and he holds it like a baby and we photograph him. We then photograph everyone else on the train who wanted to hold the World Series trophy. He said, um, or I, I said, would you like to come to opening day when we present the rings to our players? He said, can I bring my son? I said, you can. He said, I would like that. So over the winter, we took the trophy around everywhere. We had won for the first time in 86 years. It was a celebration that I think is still going on uh, all these 16 years later. And for the magazine, the scorecard uh, for April of 2005, I made a mosaic of all of these little pictures, just like our, our Zoom uh, screen. Um, all these little little rectangular pictures of people who held the trophy. And it, it you know, I remembered the, the conductor and I put his picture on there. And it all came and it went and, uh, and that was fine. Now, two years later, Two years later, it's January of 2006. It's time for us to put tickets on sale for the season. And Fenway Park, if you don't know, is a red brick old building that doesn't even look like a ballpark from the outside. And you might not even know that it is a ballpark where you to pass it. So I wanted to have a sign on a billboard to let you know you're in the neighborhood and the tickets are going to go on sale January 28th. But, so I, I wanna put a billboard up and I want a photo of player fan interaction, not just players celebrating, not just fans. Well, my desk, this actual very desk that I now have at home is covered with slides. And I'm looking at slide after slide after slide after slide just looking for the right picture. And I find it. Here's a cool picture of our right fielder, Trot Nixon, shaking hands with three young guys in their early 20s. And even though it's a profile of all four of them, you can see 
this jubilation, this this joy on their faces, even Trot Nixon's too, as they're shaking hands. And I put the billboard up. Well, about 10 days later, I get a phone call from a TV reporter in Boston from Fox 25. His name is Butch Stearns. And he said, um, Dr. Charles, can I come over and do a story with you about that article in the Boston Herald today? I said, oh, you're ahead of me. I haven't read the Boston Herald yet. He said, oh, there's a very uh, serious spiritual article about a husband and wife who lost their son in the military. He was not killed by gunfire. He was actually killed by a drunk driver, but while serving. And they're a very uh, religious family, and they have longed for a sign from above that their son is okay. And it turns out you have a billboard up across the street from Fenway Park, and their son is shaking Trot Nixon's hand. I said, oh my God, what have I done? They said, no, no, they actually take it as a, a reassuring sign. In fact, they have lunch at the little restaurant at Fenway Park, game on, right under the billboard. I said, well, come on over. So he comes over and does the story. And yeah, I explained that clearly I was an instrument. I was a messenger. I didn't pick the slide. And um, ESPN sees the story and wants to do a follow-up. Only now we're at spring training. Well, ESPN does a story with Trot Nixon and me, but separately. Now, Trot Nixon's a born-again Christian. I'm a born-the-first-time Jew. And we don't hear each other's <laughs> interviews. And we say, like, the same thing word for word. You know, clearly we were called upon to, to play this role and give comfort uh, to this family. Now it's time for the billboard to come down. And I think I was still at spring training. We offer it to the family, and um, they say, well, it's too big. We would need a truck to receive it, um, uh, you know, but thank you. And then they call back, and they say, oh, friends of ours have a truck. We can receive it. So good. The, the billboard went, went to the family. Now, a few weeks later, it's April of 2006. And I'm in a conference room at Fenway Park. It was called the Red Conference Room because the seats were red. And my cell phone rings and it's my colleague, Sam Kennedy, who's now the president and CEO of the Red Sox, but he was in charge of corporate partnerships. And he calls me on the phone, he says, are you here? I said, yeah, I'm in the Red Conference Room. He said, can you come across the hall to the Green Conference Room? Green chairs. I said, sure. So I go across the hall. And there's Sam, who's an affable fellow, a cheerful fellow, but he looks a little bit nervous. And he's with three gentlemen who are like out of central casting as business executives. Salt and pepper hair, dark suits, immaculately put together. And Sam says, um, we have a little problem and we're hoping that you can solve it for us. I said, sure, what? These gentlemen are from Gulf Oil, and we're trying to sign them to a very lucrative deal to put the Gulf Oil logo in foul territory on the Green Monster. But they don't want to sign unless they meet you. I said, well, I'm very flattered, but I'm not David Ortiz. And the one in the middle said, no, but let me tell you who I think you are. He said, two years ago, the Red Sox had a caravan to Warwick, Rhode Island. I said, that's right. He said, there was a little boy, I said, wearing a Veritech jersey. That was my son. He said, you changed my son's life. 11 years old is awkward for anybody. Self-esteem is wobbly. And my son went into school the next day and he was the king of the class. He showed the autographs, he showed the photographs, the kids gathered around. You changed my son's life. There's nothing I wouldn't do for the Red Sox. I just wanted to meet the people who did this for my son and my family. Wow, okay, I didn't see that coming. 
Two months later, I close on the purchase of the house that I'm in right here on the South Shore of Boston, the South Shore of Massachusetts. It was my way to get back to the ocean having lived in San Diego. And I purchased the house on June 30th, 2006. On July 1st, I'm sitting looking at the ocean with two friends from college who are visiting, a husband and wife. And two ladies get out of the ocean and they come over and they go, oh, you're our new next door neighbor. I said, yes, I'm Charles. Oh, well, I'm Julie and I'm Sue. We're the Clancy's from Quincy. Our mother is the matriarch of a family of 10 and uh, all of us use this house next door to you. I said, very nice to meet you, nice to meet you. The next day is July 2nd and a fellow gets out of the ocean young guy in his 20s, comes over and says, um, I heard you met my mother and my aunt yesterday. I said, oh, yes, the Clancy's from Quincy. He said, I'm Robbie. And I shake his hand. I said, I'm Charles Steinberg. Now, the day before, I had said I was Charles, but I hadn't said Charles Steinberg. And he said, um, it is you. It is you. Dr. Charles from the Red Sox. Are you kidding me? You're going to live next door to us? I said, yeah, that, that that's true. He goes, oh my God, we love the Red Sox. They've been so good to our family and our friends. Oh, we love the Red Sox. You mean to tell me that Larry Lucchino is going to sit out here on your porch with you and talk baseball? I said, yeah, that, that's, that's, my, that's my hope. Um, he goes, that's, that's just amazing. We just love the Red Sox so much. Look, tomorrow we're doing a bonfire. Not July 4th, July 3rd. We're doing a bonfire. How about if you come and meet the rest of the family? I said, that will be great. Next day is July 3rd. The sun goes down. It's therefore dark. And on the beach, the only source of illumination is the bonfire. And I'm looking for faces. All I've met are his mother, his aunt, and himself. I'm looking to see who I recognize. Thank goodness he recognizes me. Ah, Dr. Charles, Robbie. Yes, yeah, this is my brother. You met my mother, my aunt. Here's another aunt. You know, it's just amazing. Uh, we love the Red Sox so much. And it's amazing with the poster and everything that you live next door to us. I said, with, with the what? He said, you know, with, with the poster uh, of Trot Nixon. I said, what do you know about the Trot Nixon poster? He goes, well, that's me and my brother in the picture. That was our buddy who was killed in the military. And me and my brother are on each side of him. I said, in the billboard? He goes, yeah. That you, what you did for that family is amazing. I said, that's you? He goes, yeah. In fact, you wanted to give the poster to the family. They couldn't take it because they didn't have a truck. I had the truck. Oh my God. So I'm getting the chills as he's telling me this story and an older white haired gentleman comes over to me and says, I wanted to meet you. You earned a good name in our community. I said, you're a, a member of the Clancy's from Quincy? He goes, no, I'm Marty Cohen from Randolph. Didn't see that one coming. I said, all right, well, thank you. Uh, what did I do? He said, we were all friends with Larry Solomon. I'm thinking Larry Solomon, I meet a lot of people. He said, the train conductor. I said, what? Wow. He said, we all know what you did for him and his family, but you don't know what you did. We all know the story. He met you on the train. And we know what he told you, that he thought he'd never live to see the day that the Red Sox would win. That's because he had leukemia, and he knew he didn't have much longer to live. But he got to go to opening day with his son. He saw his picture on the cover of the magazine. He died later that year, but we all know what you did for him, but you don't know what you did for him. You earned a good name in our community. Now I was leaving in two days for Israel and I thought, am I going? Is this the finale? It was like the, the closing of a, of a Broadway show for all of this to come together but made it to Israel, made it back. And amazingly, I leave for the Dodgers. 
I wind up working for Commissioner Sealing. I come back to the Red Sox. And as I come back to the Red Sox, four years later, I get an email from HR and it lists our summer interns. And it says, um, for each one, a little thumbnail. You know, what, what school do you go to? What college? What's your favorite Red Sox memory? And by now, their favorite memory is winning the 2004 World Series, winning the 2004 World Series, winning the 2004 World Series. This one. When I was a little boy, I got to meet Jason Veritek on a Red Sox caravan to Rhode Island. I went, oh my God. The little boy was now an intern and an intern for the Red Sox. And I met him for the first time in years. And he pulled out the pictures from that day and said, I've been carrying these around knowing I would meet you someday. So all that I've learned about baseball and the business of baseball has nothing to do with accounting or finance or spreadsheets or budgets. Everything is everything that each one of you already knows. It's personal. It touches people deeply. And if you remember that, then you can shield yourself from some of the nuisance news that you see when the when Major League Baseball is at odds with Minor League Baseball, when the owners are at odds with the players, and you just want to tell them to shush and stop messing up our game. Because at the heart of it, it's not even what happens on the field. It's the way baseball translates into the community, saturates the community. And for me, it takes me back to Chuck Thompson at the Bethel Men's Club when I was about seven years old. So I thank you for perpetuating those opportunities for others to uh, get to have those shared experiences. And now let's see if I can take some of your questions and see if I know any of the answers. How about that? Is that okay? That's good. That's great. All right, incredible. All right, the question is, uh, have I met Chaim Bloom? Uh, and his ideas from Tampa Bay. I've shaken Chaim's hand. I haven't spent a lot of time with him. Um, someone who I'm very, very close with, uh, and who works with me, worked with me at the Red Sox, the Paw Sox, and the um, uh, now the Woo Sox, is very close with Chaim. So we we know each other by association. We met, but I haven't spent uh, much time with him. Um, and uh, let's see. Do you have a decent budget to recruit good players? Yeah, the Red Sox spend a lot of money. Um, it just doesn't guarantee you that they win because you got to spend it wisely. But yet, I lament that they didn't sign Mookie Betts. I love Mookie Betts, but it's not my money. But they do have a big payroll. Is there a retirement ceremony planned for Dustin Pedroia? I think we have to wait till Dustin officially chooses to retire. Um, if we plan a ceremony, before he retires, um, that, that, can, that can be a little bit offensive. But we've done ceremonies for everybody who has retired from David Ortiz, Jason Veritek, uh, Tim Wakefield, and I could, I could sure see doing one for him. But I'll tell you, his is gonna be different, different and difficult because he is made to play. His body is a little energetic jumping beam. And when he does have to concede whenever that is that his body is done it's going to be it's going to be tough for him uh is it more challenging to do marketing for a major league team that has trouble attracting fans or a minor league team you know i haven't found it to be particularly different um when i went from being executive vice president of the boston red sox to president of the of the Pawtucket red sox some people thought it was a step down. Some people thought it was uh, lateral. I said, you know, there's nothing minor league about people. There's nothing minor league about fans. There's nothing minor league about an eight-year-old. Yes, in Boston, I'm orchestrating ceremonies for 37,000, at the Dodgers for 56,000, and in Pawtucket on a good day, eight or 9,000, but that's okay. You're still touching people the same way. So I find the marketing of a ball club at the major league level to be rather similar to what you do at the minor league level. It's about the music. It's about the entertainment. It's about the personalities of your players. You're not, you're not going to market successfully, in my experience, 
unless you're with the Yankees, by just claiming that you're going to win. The Yankees have a motto, win. We diversify. We want a, a competitive team, but we want a fun environment. We want to be active in the community. So really, I think uh, that is, is pretty similar. Um, how did the uh, Paw Sox get to Worcester? We fully intended to stay in Pawtucket, our home of 50 years, and we uh, signed a 30-year agreement to stay there. Um, the agreement was signed by us, by the mayor of Pawtucket, by uh, a representative of the governor's office, with three innocuous words or so, I thought, pending legislature approval. And those words became gigantic because while the Senate did a full scrutiny and you know, we had a lot of testimony, the House of Representatives had a speaker who was at odds politically, it seemed, with the governor. And if she was for it, then he was going to let it sit. And um, if you want to go read the full story in the Providence Journal, there's a story just um, two days ago by a, author, a writer named Mark Patinkin, and he nailed it. The silence for the uh, House to act on our deal was a political move. And we were getting to the point where we said, look, we have 18 cities that have approached us saying, if Pawtucket doesn't want you, we'll take you. And we haven't returned their phone calls. But if we don't get a deal done or approved, we're going to have to start returning those phone calls. And we love the mayor of Pawtucket, Mayor Grebby, and he's a great guy. But the House would not approve the deal we agreed to. And Larry Lucchino returned a call to Worcester. And while it's pop culture to say money, 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 the honest truth is that the people in leadership in Worcester and the governor of Massachusetts, Governor Baker, and the lieutenant governor, Karen Polito, worked in such sweet harmony to welcome us collaboratively and collectively that their unity and their harmony was such a breath of fresh air. Yes, the money worked out, but money's fungible. What actually attracted us to Worcester was uh, unity in the community. And that's why we're building a ballpark that God willing is set to open in April. Hey, Dr. Steinberg, that's yes. really not what we thought because your co-host was the reason we thought you went to Worcester, Dave Kravitz, because oh. Dave Kravitz lives in Worcester. Yes, he does. I see he, that jersey. I see that sweatshirt. And he claimed 100% that the reason that the ball club moved was because of him and his two dogs, <laughs> Fenway and Fenway and Brady. So I have two dogs, Fenway and Brady. And, Fenway and Brady. That's, and, good. that's, what else that's a be? Boston Brady. family. And I am a gigantic Red Sox fan. I actually um, I have tickets for the new ballpark. I go see it every week. Because I live in Worcester, I see it being built. I cannot wait for this to open. I am so psyched. You have no idea. Well, I number one, thank you. But number two, I won't discount that you're single-handedly responsible because, <laughs> because what I neglected to say, the leadership was wonderful. But we received 10,000 postcards from people in and around Worcester pleading with us to come. And we still have those 10,000 postcards. And all I can tell you is it mattered. It mattered and it matters. And seeing a populace that was as eager for us to come, David, you might have sent a postcard or you might have sent a bunch. I don't know. But um, I, I will say that, that it, did, it, did, it did impact us. Well, all right. How do you expect the Blue Sox will handle the Black Lives Matter issue next season? Will the approach be the same as major leagues or different? Good question, tough question, challenging issue in our organization, challenging issue in Worcester. 
It's a tough one. It's a tough one. The, my first goal is for everyone in our organization to be able to speak to each other about this issue civilly. These people work beautifully together. They love each other. And I tell them, you work fabulously together 23 out of 24 hours a day. We have a one hour session on Black Lives Matter and oh my gosh, you're either a torch bearer or you're Archie Bunker. And, and it's not really that you are, it's just that you're sometimes made to seem that way. And I've got to bridge the divide, but maybe that's a microcosm for what we have to do in, in society. The, I do worry about the sportification of politics. I worry that I'm on one side, you're on the other. I'm Red Sox, you're Yankees. I'm liberal, you're conservative. I'm Democrat, you're Republican. And it's, it's like, a, it's like a, a bad ball game. And you think that if your side wins, five to four, good, we win. Well, no, you didn't win anything because the ones with four are still living across the street from you. It's a zero sum game, we're all together. So I don't have a, a, a clear answer for you on how we'll handle it. Oh. But some people in our organization seek to divide the matter into a political approach and a social movement. But no one, no one doubts Black Lives Matter. That's not really the question, and that's where the language gets confused. It's what do you do that is constructive? And in that wonderful um, introduction that you gave me, one of the things that you mentioned is one of the things that I've tried to do to address the issue, and that was college scholarships for bright middle schoolers. So, and, and not all are minority, but many, the vast majority are, are minority, but you're finding really good diamonds in the rough in seventh and eighth grade, and you believe in them, and they get a scholarship in San Diego, $5,000. By the time we got to Boston, we made it $10,000. And uh, in Pawtucket, even though it's little Pawtucket, $10,000, just a, a few kids. And you try to change lives one life at a time when you see someone who's good, who's kind, who's bright, and you try to help them. You know, upward mobility is not easy to achieve. And um, uh, we do go and find children from disadvantaged backgrounds. They're all financially challenged. Of course, who's not financially challenged when it comes to college? But we find them and um, our scholars programs, Padre scholars, Red Sox scholars, Pot Sox scholars, and just today we're talking about getting our Woo Sox scholars going, is just, it's a way to do something positive and constructive. You can put up signs, we do. You can post social media things. I get that. But what are you actually doing? And that's, sometimes it's not sexy enough for, for some of my staff. Sometimes it's not big and bold enough. But you talk to those kids who knew they had a $10,000 scholarship and were able to withstand the destructive temptations of adolescent life, it's impactful to them. So I don't know if that's a good answer, but it's the truth. Uh, uh, Dr. Steinberg? Yes. Dr. Steinberg, yeah. um, I'm, I'm happy to say, sorry to say that my outfield was Jackie Jensen, Jimmy Pearsall, and, and uh, Ted Williams. But when we first went to the Red Sox, I did in the early 60s or whatever, it was getting for a dollar. And then when I bought season's tickets some 30 years ago, they were $20. Um, I'm now living in Florida, so I don't have my season's tickets anymore, but Bill Grogan has them. And my question is, I think when I left Worcester a few years ago, they were up to $165 a seat. So my question to you is, um, as I've asked other owners, when I, you give a ball player $365 million, how do we establish an environment where people can afford to go to baseball games. Where, where does it stop? How many people can afford $100 a ticket, $150 a ticket 
you know, five hundred dollars to bring a family. It is the question. You are you are right. It is the question. The answer I would offer you is is this. Fenway Park is in part a victim of its own popularity and success. That when when I was telling you that story about the meeting with accounting and they said, well, we've sold out every game since May 15th, it became a phenomenon. May 15th, 2003, we started a sellout streak that went all the way till 2013, the longest streak in the history of baseball. And the sellouts seemed to justify to the revenue colleagues increases and increases and increases. And Larry Lucchino is a Pittsburgh native from modest backgrounds. Um, his, you know, he was not to the manner born. Um, he can out Yiddish me, even though he's Italian Catholic, he wore a yarmulke when running for class president in high school and is quick to say, and I won. But he doesn't want anybody to be priced out. In fact, he often said years ago, I worry about the day of the $29 hot dog. Well, what we've done is relentlessly try to keep the low prices low. The high prices are bearing the market. People are buying tickets for $165 a game on a season basis but it's because those seats are oceanfront real estate. It's not a baseball play, it's a real estate play. Nobody wants to give up their 10th row tickets of field boxes at Fenway Park. They're afraid they'll never get them again. And they make deals with a bunch of friends and they divide up the tickets. Other ball clubs are not in that same situation. It's not gonna cost you $165 to get that same seat to watch the Miami Marlins. So it's very much economics playing a role at the high end, but we artificially keep tickets low at the low end. We lowered ticket prices from 18 to 12 on the lowest uh, uh, level of prices. And those seats, when we were phenomenal in 2003, four, five, those seats were being sold on the street for three or $400. We could have sold them, but you'd feel like a fool. You'd, you know, feel it's blasphemous to sell a bleacher seed for $300. But we try to keep the low prices low. Now, in minor league baseball, you're keeping everything low. So your tickets at Polar Park, $8 for a Yaz seat, or I should say a Yaz ticket. Uh, that's going to be for kids, for seniors, for students, for active members of the military. Otherwise, you got a Teddy ball game ticket, and it gets you in the ball game. It's nine dollars, and your really good seats will be um, eleven dollars for third base reserved, about fourteen dollars for first and third base field boxes, and that will give you waiter waitress service if you want to sit in the home plate boxes. So they'll be up about twenty five dollars. If you want to pay twenty five, fine but you gotta be able to go to the ball game for less than $10. And um, that's what we're trying to do. But by the way, the Red Sox still keep $9 for students. You can still get in for a, a, a $9 ticket. Sam Kennedy and I established that. So the okay. high is high. I don't have an answer for you other than economics, but the low, you wanna try to keep low. Uh, Dr. Charles, um... This is Stephen Reamer. Um, unfortunately, my question got skipped, but do you yes, believe Major that? League Baseball will cut back on minor league teams in order to reduce their cost? That's certainly what we're hearing. We're hearing that they'll go from 160 clubs to 120 clubs. I don't know that for a fact, and, and it's not um, formal yet, but that's certainly uh, what we're hearing. And I guess it, in part it's to reduce the cost. I guess to reduce the number of players. They say it's also to make sure each of the 30 clubs has the same number of minor league clubs. You know, the, the great, uh, maybe greatest baseball executive ever, Branch Rickey, created the farm system. Uh, I think when he was with the St. Louis Cardinals. Um, and, you know, it, they, they sprawled. They used to have 
uh, triple A, double A, A, B, C, D. And they've, they've, you know, gotten smaller, but it's still pretty huge. 160 clubs plus 30 major league clubs. You got 190 organized professional clubs. So, you know, we don't want to see it contract. We, we love more baseball. But, yeah, that is the talk. And it sounds like Major League Baseball is on its way to controlling minor league baseball. And um, we'll have to see how that goes. If anyone has questions, please don't ask directly. Please go through the chat. It's okay. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Phil Watzler, I met you at, at an open house at Fenway. So nice to see you again. Um, what is my favorite uh, promotion? Gosh, I don't know if I know that. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. It was probably the one that the Orioles had on my very first day of work as an intern. Uh, and this will also answer um, the next question. Uh, Gary Rosenberg asks, who's the nicest player you ever met? Brooks Robinson is still my hero, still the greatest. He is the nicest, most wonderful, sweetest guy. And on my very first day as an intern, we gave away bright orange Orioles replica jersey t-shirts with that number five of Brooks Robinson on it. And I couldn't believe that I got to be in the storeroom with thousands and thousands of Brooks Robinson replica jersey t-shirts. And um, thank God Brooks is still with us and he knows how I feel about him. And he, he gave me the biggest honor of my career by calling me up one day at Fenway Park in 2012 and asking me to speak on behalf of all of his fans when the Orioles uh, unveiled a statue for him uh, later that year. That's still, I mean, of, of the millions of kids in Baltimore and across the country who knew how great a third baseman he was and how wonderful and kind he is, that I got to be the one to speak on behalf of the fans. Brooks, Brooks is the best. By the way, when I joined the Red Sox, by phone, I got to meet Carl Yastrzemski. Now, I mean, I later met him in person, but at first it was by phone. And I said, um, Mr. Yastrzemski, he said, they call me Yaz. I said, well, I just want to thank you because you did something that I'll never forget. And he, you know, he's expecting me to say, I remember that home run you hit. I said, I said, I grew up in Baltimore. My hero is Brooks Robinson. And on September 18th, 1977, on Thanks Brooks Day, they were playing the Red Sox and you represented the Red Sox and spoke on behalf of the Red Sox in praise of Brooks Robinson. He goes, I remember that. And let me tell you something, you picked a good hero right there. So Yaz and I were off to a, a good start and, um, it's, um, and Yaz has been great too. I've loved David Ortiz, Pedro Martinez is, hilarious, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. One of the smartest people I've ever worked with. Um, Trevor Hoffman in San Diego, Tony Gwynn was wonderful. Um, and then they're the guys who are the 24th and 25th guys on the team. Uh, they are often just the most wonderful guys, just trying to hang on day by day. So from Hall of Famers like Brooks and Frank Robinson, Jim Palmer, I was the statistician to Earl Weaver. So. Uh, these are these are um, wonderful people. Ah, look at this from Marty. Yes, I actually thought about this. Do you remember the wonderful Sunday morning when you brought the four World Series trophies to Bethel Temple, West Hartford? Yes, and shared your stories with our congregation uh, and children. We will never forget how effectively communicated uh, with the children about Jewish values. I do remember that, Marty, and I thank you because I was excited to be at another Bethel. Um, and, uh, and I was, I was, I remember that day. I remember going down there and bringing the trophies and it's, you know, I actually talked to my rabbi in Brookline, uh, Rabbi Hamilton, who I adore when we won the world series. I said, I gotta be careful. We're taking the world series trophy around and I don't want people to commit idolatry. I don't want them to bow down, you know, like bow. And he said, um, he, he laughed and was, and was appreciative of my worry. He said, but it's, it's not the trophy itself that they're according powers to. It is the symbol of, of the season. He said it better than that. But um, 
that 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 I do remember bringing the trophies down uh, to West Hartford. Have I convinced Lucino yet about the Woo Sox nickname? You know, neither he nor I thought that the Worcester Red Sox would be nicknamed the Woo Sox. We thought we'd come up with something better, something more clever, something more original, something more Worcester. 218 fan submissions, and a lot of them were good, but Worcester just seemed to slide right into the comfort of the Woo Sox. And what you don't want to do, in my opinion, in marketing and baseball, is think you're smarter than the fans. You're not. You never are. The best thing that we have going for us is that we are fans. I am still 10 years old. I still want to score the game with a scorecard. I still want my nachos. And if the fans are telling you that they like the Woo Sox, it's their team. Don't, don't take yourself too seriously. Don't think you're smarter than everybody else. All we are is all they are, which is all you want to be, and that's uh, to be a fan. Dave would have written all 10,000 uh, postcards. I, I, I'm hearing that, Dave. Dave, we're, we're going to have a special time. We're going to give you a special tour of Polar Park That'd be great. during the construction. But there's, but there's something that David doesn't have that I do have. This is one of the, <laughs> this is one of the World Series rings. Wait a minute, where am I seeing that? Uh, hold on. Danny hold on. Mando. And hold here's on. one of the other ones. And I always like to show David that because that's one of the, mind. that's one of the, so, so my son works for the Red Sox and has two out of the three rings. And David, one day maybe you'll get one, but it'll be in Worcester. Yeah, I know. Worcester. No, Danny, Man, say it's Mando. Yeah, Mando. And who, who works for the Red Sox? Jeffrey Mando, he, he's a videographer. He does all the scoreboards. So I've got to go to World Series, but you know, it's who you know. <laughs> he, so he works for John Carter? Yes. And I hired John Carter, so how about that? Good, I'll have to tell him. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a grandfather. There's no hours going forward after this week, but you know, what are you going to do? Uh, maybe he'll work for the Woosage. You never know. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> now, also, before I return to the questions, I saw uh, Cashel. Where, where was, where did it speak? Is that Danny Cashel's dad who I saw on here? Aaron Cashel? Uh, yeah, was, was it Aaron Cashel? That is, that's his father. That's Danny's father? That's Danny's father, for sure. Where are, where are you? Where are you? Speak so you come back on. Let's see if I can find him. I'm looking for him too. Because I met I met Aaron Cashel before. And his son Danny ran the control room in 2002 at the Red Sox, worked for me, and, and we had a wonderful friendship and relationship. And he moved away for the best of reasons. He married a wonderful woman who was a rabbi. And she got a congregation, if I'm remembering, in Westchester, New York, if I'm remembering right. And now they're on the West Coast. Is that right? Where? They're in California. I don't remember the city. But I'm going to call uh, Aaron and tell him to get back on this call. Well, <laughs> if, he, if he has something else to do, don't worry. But please tell him to give my fondest uh, regards to, to Danny. I will uh, do that. I will Danny, do that. And, Danny and I, if, we, if Danny were on the call, we would just laugh. We, because you just get, you just have a flood of memories. But yeah, I, I met Danny's father. All right, let me see how, um, thank you from a retired um, um, math teacher, right? Um, there you go, well, thank you. Being Earl Weaver statistician was interesting because uh, I did that with a medium point blue big pen uh, and a calculator. Uh, let's see, how do you think baseball will adjust to cord cutting as backlash to cable prices? Great question. Oh my gosh, that's a good question. It's one of the most important questions that's going to determine franchise values. If you're seeing uh, Steve Cohen is uh, reportedly offering $2.4 billion for the Mets, and, fran and that's a record. So franchise values keep going up and up and up and up. And one of the reasons is that whether you like baseball or don't, whether you watch it or not, you're paying when you pay your cable bill. In Boston, you're paying Nesson. In Baltimore and Washington, you're paying Masson. And we do wonder, Will w here's the question, will cord cutting prevail? 
And if it does, baseball is going to have to earn its customers, I think, uh, with a little bit more directness than simply somebody having cable and you're, and you're getting those, uh, those few dollars. So, all right. Uh, those are the questions that I can see. Are there any more uh, that you have or, or did that take care of everybody's uh, baseball hunger? Listen, we, we really appreciate you've given us over an hour of your time. Um, and we've had several of these and no one's done that for us. So uh -huh. we really, we really, uh, Appreciate. And does anyone they don't have talk any as questions? much as I do? So I, you ever got your own bobblehead? <laughs> <laughs> I never got my own bobblehead. But uh, what is that thing called? Um, there's this little thing. It's like a Lego, but um, and and kids are very impressed. But somebody from the Red Sox went to work for this company, and they made a a little thing of me that is. Um, it's just some funny little doll, and they were more impressed with that than even a bobblehead. So. No bobbleheads for me yet, and that's just as well. Who knows what they would they would do? <laughs> so, all right. Well, I would. Um, I guess. Do Do you all? Are you always doing this virtually because you're all over the country, or uh, is there ever a time when you all are physically together? We'd love to be physically together. We just started doing this a few months ago because we have not been able to get together. We actually have a convention every two years, which we still hope to have in Chicago in, at the end of June, beginning of July. Um, so this is kind of a new thing for us, but uh, out of necessity. Well, I commend you for doing it. You know, I, I just think it's, I think it's just great. Oh, by the way. I don't, uh, have, I don't have a question, but I, I'm disappointed because I was looking forward to welcoming you at the Beth Israel Synagogue, where you were, as you remember, you're an honorary member uh, of our conservative congregation in Worcester. And most important, most important, I want to wish you and your family a happy, a healthy new year from all of us, Worcester well, and all of Massachusetts. And, and just wish you the best for a, a wonderful new year. Thank you. Wasn't I was supposed to speak there, what, in March, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah. it was, but we but unfortunately... COVID, COVID got you know, us. COVID got you us. got it. Well, I'll take a rain check. I'll, I'll take a rain absolutely. check. Absolutely. Absolutely. I just want to thank uh, Dr. Steinberg because this has been absolutely phenomenal. As a huge Red Sox fan, as everybody in this call knows, I am like off the charts. And, and Red Sox are just are, are it for me. And having the Woo Sox in Worcester, to me, is like heaven. It's so phenomenal. I cannot wait. Um, you are absolutely... Absolutely fantastic. I really, well, really want to thank you. I know you're a really busy guy. You got a lot on your plate. And, you know, on behalf of the Federation of Jewish Men's Club, uh, you know, we really thank you because uh, we know what it means to give up your time and to be part of this group and, and to help us. And, and Alan, Alan Stoll was on. I listen, recognize Alan Stoll. I'm also a member of Beth Israel. And we w would love to have you come and visit us Anytime that you would like to, feel free. Well, thank you. you know, we'll make an honor. We'll make you an honorary member of our brotherhood. That's what we'll do. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I accept the offer. I'll, I'll take you up on it. And to those who are in in the uh, Baltimore, Washington area, or if any of you in San Diego or Los Angeles and Milwaukee, other places where I've lived, uh, I've enjoyed my time everywhere. And um, uh, and please uh, please do send word to uh, Aaron Cashel. Uh, to give my fondest memories to Danny, and I'm thrilled Dr. to get Dr. Steinberg, I just got off the phone with him, and he had to get off, but he said he Danny spoke so highly of you. Just so you know, we had a great time together. You we should reach out to each other again. That's what he said. Yeah, we 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 just laughed. I didn't know he went to the West Coast, but I'm I'm glad yeah, to hear San it. San Jose is his wife is a rabbi in the San Jose show. San Jose, nice yeah. going. That's you, you know you just have, as um, the Jews. <clears throat> The Jews are all connected in the diaspora. We have a baseball <laughs> diaspora. We're, we all still stay connected. So yeah, you have a big, you, uh, you have so, a big Dodgers fan on on the line, Mitch Dax. He's on my screen. So, oh my goodness! The guy who just waved. That's okay. Right. Thank, so, thank Dr. you, Mitch. Dr. Charles. I have to yeah. apologize that Danny is not a good host. <laughs> uh, as the president of the FJMC, I really apologize for him. If he'd be a nice guy, he would invite you to a Cubs. Brewers game in uh, Milwaukee. What's the date, Danny? The date would be on uh, June 
29th. June 29th. We're, uh, 2021. We God we're willing. For our international convention, we're going to see the, the Cubs play the Brewers in Milwaukee with a behind the fence, a kosher behind the fence party or whatever it's being called. So we'd love to have you join us and, uh, uh, well, and, uh, and be, part of the, be, be part of the fun at Miller Park. You're right. I'm not, a, I'm not a good host, but uh, th that's a good, great invitation. We'd love to, love to have you. Well, so, I loved living in Milwaukee. I love Commissioner Seelig. He is the funniest guy when the camera's not on. And, yeah. um, <laughs> and let's not... Let's not forget my affection for my 18-year-old intern who walked into my office in uh, in April of in March of 1992, and boy could he write, and boy was he bright. And there's your president of the Chicago Cubs, Theo Epstein. So, uh, so <laughs> first 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 uh, first job for, was for Theo. So. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Maybe I'll see you in Milwaukee. Maybe I'll see you in San Diego, Los Angeles, okay. even, even Yankee Stadium. I'll definitely see you in Worcester. Our, um, our next, and Worcester. Our next um, webinar is on Tuesday, October 13th. Write this down. Tuesday, October 13th. It's the wrestlers. It's the Jewish wrestlers that the great Rabino, remember him from one of our previous, he has... He has class. hired them, and he, they're going to entertain us. Tuesday, October 13th, 8 p.m. Eastern. You'll hear more about it. Thank you again, Dr. Steinberg. And a big yes to Kravitz. He did a great job. Thank you. Thank you, David. Yeah, thank you. And yes, I did practice dentistry part-time for 10 years. Thank you. Thank you all. Have, a, have an easy fast, everybody. Yeah. Have a good fast, everyone. Excellent. Absolutely phenomenal. Thank you, Dr. Steinberg. Great job. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Steinberg. Excellent. Shana Tova to everybody on the line. Shana Tova. Thanks very much, Dave. It was great. And thanks, Dr. Steinberg. Shana Tova, everybody. You are a superman. Thank you. Shana Tova. And the Sox are winning, beating the O's now. Okay. Good night. There you go. All right. Thank you. It's you a winning did. streak. Bye-bye. Right. The question Bye. is how the Celtics will do tomorrow. <laughs> uh, we hopefully they do well. They need to win. Simple as that. I'm going to get out of this. All right, guys. Thank All you. Right. It was Have great. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank Almost done. Danny was phenomenal. Thank you. It was great. Good mm -hmm. job. Thank you. It was great. It was send me his uh, email, David. Don't forget. Yeah, I got the email. I'm going to send him a vine. Yeah, I'm nice program. He was a good choice. Yeah, he was an unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah, he would have kept on going, too. It was, I know. Yeah. He was great. I mean, how can you go wrong? There's, there's no way. <laughs> All right, I mean, guys. Have a good one. His Jewish needs the you pregnant. You know, the president of the Low Sox. What else is there? There's what nothing else? else. That's it. We pulled it off. All right. Take care. All right. Bye.